Good afternoon, Jeff. Uh, that's what I want to hear. A little bit about myself. I was a teacher here in this city for 36 years. And I used to take my kids on field trips. Well, kids, we're going on a field trip. A mobile classroom, if you want to call it. And we're going to see several historic sites and talk about some of the people that has made this community what it is today. We are first going to drive up Beach Street to Fennel's Corner, but I want to tell you a little bit about Beach Street. Beach Street used to be called County Road in the 17th century. It was the only major thoroughfare in what was then called Rumney Marsh. Our community was called Lumney Marsh from the early beginnings in the 17th century until 1739, when we were part of Chelsea, along with Winthrop, as a matter of fact. And then in 1846, there were enough people here that we broke away and formed the town of North Chelsea. And we were North Chelsea from 1846 to 1871. And in 1871, we became the town of Revere, named after Paul Revere. And from 1871 to 1915, we were in the town. And in 1915, we were incorporated as a city, electing our first mayor. County Road extended from Broadway, which was the Salem Turnpike, right down Beach Street here to School Street, all the way down School Street to Broadway, down Broadway to Squire Road. That was County Road. It was the only major thoroughfare. There were seven farms in Revere at that time owned by wealthy men, one of whom was Robert Keeney, that Keeney Street is named after. Robert Keeney's farm was off of Squire Road. Who was Robert Keeney? He was a tailor from England who didn't like so much that he wasn't making a lot of money. So he came to America to see if he could amass a fortune, and indeed he did. He bought up commodities that other people had trouble buying, and he sold them for a huge profit. He became very, very wealthy. The church frowned on this, and for many years, he was an outlaw to the church, but he didn't care. Anyway, he lived like a country squire. He not only had a wealthy home in Boston, but he had a hunting lodge here in Rumney Marsh. He married his son, Benjamin, off to the daughter of Governor Dudley, the governor of Massachusetts at that time. He had a huge library and became the first captain of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company of Massachusetts, the oldest military company in the country. Today, it still exists. Its headquarters are at Faneuil Hall. If you go into Faneuil Hall, you can go up to the fourth floor. There you will see the headquarters of the Ancient and Honorable, and Captain Keeney's picture is there, along with the other captains. He had an extraordinary will of 158 pages. He bequested to the city of Boston not only a covered market, but also a cistern where water could be poured in and also gave money for the creation of a library. Today he is buried in King's Chapel Burial Ground. If you walk into King's Chapel Burial Ground on Tremont Street and you go to the left, you will see this huge stone, looks like a fireplace. And if you read it, you will see Robert Keeney <laughs> and underneath had a hunting lodge in Rumney Marsh. Here we are at Fennel's Corner. This is the Salem Turnpike, what today is Broadway. On March 6, 1802, the Commonwealth, of the, the colony of Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts, excuse me, approved a plan for a turnpike, a turnpike that would run from Lynn all the way to Boston. Two toll houses along the way were established. One was here at Fennel's Corner. William Fennel ran not only this particular toll house, but he also ran a grocery store, and our first post office was right here at Fennel's Corner. It cost six cents for a horse and wagon to cross on the Salem Turnpike, and 17 cents for an oxen team with wagon. There were robbers called highwaymen that frequented the Salem Turnpike. One was a man by the name of Michael Martin, who, on August 21st, 1821, robbed a major bray of everything he had, $12. His wife was with Major Bray, but she was left alone because Martin said, I don't, I don't bother with women. Well, captured in Springfield the next day, he was charged with not only robbery, but also with horse theft. While he was imprisoned, Martin overpowered a guard, stole the key, and he escaped. He was caught in a cornfield not far away, and he was placed in a cell, obviously with a stronger chain. 
On December 20th, 1821, he was hanged in Cambridge. For 70 years, this road was known as the Salem Turnpike. And then, on January 25th, 1870, it was changed to Broadway. And it is today our main thoroughfare. 107, follow it all the way, still goes to Lynn. This is where, near where, the famous Battle of Chelsea Creek took place, and I'd like to tell you a little story about this first naval battle in American history. In early 1775, there existed a committee of safety in Massachusetts. People like Hancock and Adams and Joseph Warren were part of that. They ordered that all livestock are to be immediately taken from both Hog Island, which today is Orient Heights, and Noddles Island, which is today East Boston. Why? So that it was hoped that the British wouldn't have fresh meat and then they would eventually evacuate Boston, which they eventually did the following year. Colonel John Stark from New Hampshire was stationed in Medford with his troops. He set off for Chelsea immediately from Medford, while Colonel John Nixon, a Massachusetts native, set out from Chelsea on the morning of May 27th. All colonial forces met at the old church on Beach Street to plan their actions. Their first move was to go to the Sale Farm, S-A-L-E. John Sale owned the farm that's today Beachmont. There, they thought geographically it would be much easier to cross the water and into Orient Heights and, and East Boston and clear the livestock off. Well, they did a good job, except for one thing. After Hog Island, when they went to Noddles Island, a few colonists got a little bit too anxious, and they piled up haystacks and they burned them. Well, the smoke rising in the air was seen by the British warship Preston in Boston Harbor, and they knew something suspicious was going on. So they told another ship, the Diana, to go down Chelsea Creek and see what's going on. And so the Diana went down Chelsea Creek on May 27th, 1775. There they were met by colonial militias, maybe 300 men, from Nixon, Stark, and Captain Samuel Sprague, a Chelsea native, and they began to fire at the ship standing in water and ditches up to their waist. The um, battle lasted most of the day. From muddy ditches, the British soon retreated, and the battle continued. Later that day, most of the livestock had successfully been taken from both islands. British ships continued to fire at the, at the Colonials all day. Soon the Diana, because of low tide, became grounded in the mud. Perfect. In the meantime, that night, General Israel Putnam came up with his troops from Connecticut, and he took command of the entire colonial army. He ordered a, a colonist by the name of Loami Baldwin to go out and, and set fire to the Diana, which he did. If Baldwin sounds familiar, it is he who invented the Baldwin apple. And upon research that I did, and I didn't know this prior to my research, he is called the father of civil engineering because he did so much work early in that field, well, Army Baldwin. And sure enough, he rode out with about a dozen men, and they burned the Diana. By that time, of course, all the British sailors and Marines had left. Casualties? Only one colonist was killed, but 20 British soldiers were killed and 50 were wounded. The importance, this is what I want to stress, the importance of the Battle of Chelsea Creek and why we study it. Number one, it was the first military engagement where a British ship was captured. One could say it was the first naval battle in American history. Two, several colonies, for the first time, joined forces to defeat a common Nixon from Massachusetts, Stock from New Hampshire, Putnam from Connecticut. Three, it was the first time cannon brought by Putnam was used in the Revolution. And finally, excluding the capture of Fort Ticonderoga the previous May, excuse me, um, earlier that, that month in May uh, on, on Lake Champlain, excluding that, the Battle of Chelsea Creek could actually be called the second major battle of the American Revolution after Lexington and Concord. So several years ago, 
many of us got together and decided to create a monument. And I was chosen to pick, to, to, to write what's on here. And as you can see, it's a very short but interesting story of what I just told you. The Battle of Chelsea Creek. Okay, let's go. Thank you. <laughs> Do they know the actual area where the ship was burned? Like, yes. Able to Just past the skating rink. Oh, right over here. Oh, yeah, oh. because remember, there, this was all water. Uh, this was yeah. all water. There was no Broadway. <laughs> so I, I, can't, I can't even picture it. In 1721, our neighbors here in Rumney Marsh petitioned the selectmen for a mill of our own. For years, we had to go to Malden, where our grain, our corn and other grain, were made into fine powder to be used. In 1734, Thomas Pratt built this mill. It's a tidewater mill. The water would come in from there and turn a wheel that was like this. Let me explain to you. Pratt sold the mill to the Watts family, Samuel Clark, and later to a fellow by the name of James Stowers. Streets in Rivera named after these people. The important date is July 29, 1827. On that date, it was sold to Henry Slade for $4,000. In 1868, the mill and dam were conveyed to his sons, David and Levi Slade. Originally, the mill would ground corn, but the two boys were smart enough to say, wait a minute, Spices might be interesting to import and grind and sell to our good people. And sure enough, over the next decades, ginger came in from Sumatra and Java and Ceylon, paprika from Spain, pepper and nutmeg from the East Indies, cloves came in from Zanzibar, and even ginger from Jamaica. Spices became as popular here in New England as salt. As the tide came in, the sluice gates were forced open, creating an artificial pond. As the water receded below the dam, the mill's gates opened and water flowed to round cylinders. Each cylinder contained a shaft. At the upper end of the shaft is a wooded car gear. It's a wheel connected to another shaft that turned, it, that turned the grinding wheel. This grinding wheel had a stone that weighed eight 1,800 pounds. By the 20th century, the D&L Slade Company was doing quite well. They had a, an office in Boston as well as here. Spices were becoming as popular as salt, as I mentioned. Henry, the old man, lived many years. One of his sons, David, was 92 when he passed on. That old expression, spice of life, maybe spices do lead to old age. Maybe yep, on June 30th, 1972, after years of inactivity, this mill was placed on the National Register of Historic Sites. Today, a private company owns this property. And there are many small apartments, one bedroom apartments. On the ground floor, there are pictures, old machinery, and even a glass case of some of the old spices that were once sold by Slade. By the way, the Slade company no longer exists. However, Bell Seasoning, which you're probably familiar with, bought out the Slade company. So really when you're buying Bell Seasonings, usually around Thanksgiving, that's a product of the Slades. And there is our mill. Any questions? Okay, let's go on. Interesting man literary gentleman by the name of Horatio Alger Jr. Horatio Alger Jr. was the son of Horatio Alger Sr. who was a minister in Chelsea at the old church in the 19th century. He went to Harvard, the young man, to become a minister. But he grew disillusioned and he actually moved out of Massachusetts <coughs> to New York. In New York he began to walk the streets and what he saw shocked him. He saw young boys begging on the streets, shining shoes, selling match, match sticks to make a, a few cents. Many were orphans. Some were homeless, living in a cardboard box. He began to write stories about these boys, 
And these stories soon became bestsellers. They all had the same theme. Homeless, poor, young boy, through cleanliness, good morals, acting gentlemanly, would succeed in business. And by the end of the book, he was successful, monetarily as well as status-wise. Churches and schools would promote, would promote Alger's books because obviously they taught good manners and there were lessons to young men to, again, as long as you were upstanding, as long as you took care of your manners, were good to your parents, you would amount to something. Horatio Alger Jr. Even though he was born in Revere, his family didn't stay here long. They moved to South Natick. And today, Horatio Alger Jr. is buried in a cemetery in South Natick. But he's a world famous author. And by the way, if you get a chance to look, uh, to go into our museum, we have a whole room dedicated to Horatio Alger Jr. Right now, we're heading down toward Revere Beach, the oldest public beach in the country. We're going to stop at Elliott Circle. I'm going to tell you who that was named after. And as we move down the beach, I'll mention several of the eating establishments and amusements and hotels and dancing halls that were once there. This is Elliott Circle, named after Charles Elliott, an architect, Harvard grad, who came here and he couldn't believe the rundown condition of this beach. Houses half built, dilapidated stores, and he decided to redesign the entire beach and make it a spectacle, and he did. And if you look over here where the Atlantic Towers is located, at one time there was a beautiful dance hall called the Spanish Gables. In the 1930s and 40s, one could dance to big band music, have a nice meal. And believe it or not, out here where the remnants of the pier is located was also oh, yeah. a restaurant and a dance hall that burned down in 1939. Can you imagine women in their finest evening gowns, men in suits and tuxedos, walking on, in the cool summer air off to the uh, dance hall, eating a nice dinner, and just enjoying themselves for the evening. This was one of several dance halls on Revere Beach. There was also the Beach View Ballroom. This building right here uh, was built after the Ocean View, which was built after the Spanish Gables, burned down in 1960. The Ocean View Ballroom continued the work that the Spanish Gables did. And then when that burned down, well, live music was kind of passe, and so they decided to rebuild this apartment building in 1960. The Beach View uh, dance, uh, um, dance Hall is further down the beach, and when I get to it, I'll, I'll, I'll point it out to you. Um, and there was also the Frolic Nightclub. You all know about the Frolic Nightclub. Frolic Nightclub, exactly. Barbara Streisand, Tony Vale, Tony Fields. People got their starts at the Frolic Nightclub. As a kid, I would look in the window wishing that I could get in. Okay, but my parents, after a day at the beach, we'd go home, shower, get dressed. The babysitter would come and my parents would go to the Frolic. Okay? Majesty and Barbara Streisand for $5 at the Frolic. Danny's sold foot-long hot dogs, but the thing that I love were the pepper burgers. I used to love the pepper burgers growing up. The bandstand on the right, Punk's Corner it used to be called, the William G. Reinstein Pavilion. I met my wife there in 1970. Right here, where we're making the turn, was the Beach View Ballroom. Now let me tell you the story about the Beach View Ballroom. Like the Spanish Gables, you could dance there, but it also had an escalator that led up to a roof garden. It also had a movie theater in the back on the Ocean Ave side, where they used to give out dishes to people on certain nights. That's right, the Beach View. The night it burned down, my father, I was 12 years old, my father took me and we stood across the street at Revere Beach Station. You could feel the heat from the fire. Okay? Really? There you go, yeah. Wow. Now, along this strip, Rudolph's Peppered Steak. 
Rudolph's Peppered Steak, specialized obviously in Peppered Steak, but the thing that I remember is that they would give you a Peppered Steak sandwich in a Hamburg room. And there was so much Peppered Steak that there was more on the dish than there was in the bun. <laughs> Hurley's, Hurley's Hurdlers, Hurley's Rides were here. Her, John Hurley and his brothers were very big on Revere Beach at one time. The Whip, the Double Ferris Wheel, the regular Ferris Wheel, bumping cars, the Hippodrome, all located right here. Sandy's Rides with the carousel right here. Joe and Nemo's, huh? Joe and Nemo's, right? I think they had about 30 grandmothers. Tilt the World, Hurley's. Oh, yeah. Tilt the World. Tilt the World, yep. We're coming up on the um, police station. Before we get there, let me tell you about that. That's an icon. I don't use that word too often. But that's an icon in Revere's history because back in the late 19th century, one could go there, rent a bathing suit and a towel, leave by a tunnel underneath so they wouldn't have to cross the street, get to the other side, and sit there all day. Now. As Bill pulls over, okay, you'll notice there was a clock here, okay? And the clock had a face on both sides. Why? Because people that were sitting on the beach had to know the time so they wouldn't be late bringing back their bathing suits and rented towels and have to pay an extra charge. But imagine a, t a, a tunnel underneath so you can walk right onto the beach. Also, they're building dressing rooms from what Council Novoselsky told me right next door here. Now. Here was the Cyclone roller coaster. There were three roller coasters on Revere Beach, the Cyclone, the Thunderbolt, and the Lightning. The Lightning was a little further down that way. Didn't last long because it was an all steel uh, roller coaster and the sailor was killed in its first year, so it closed down. The Cyclone was in existence until the early 70s, and then of course the blizzard of 78 really did a number on it. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ridden, rid, rode the Cyclone, but it was quite a, quite a trip. Also, the Virginia Reel. How many remember the Virginia Reel? You'd sit in a tub. The tub would go like this, and you'd go like this, and, and sometimes you felt like you were going to fall out onto Ocean Avenue. Oh, I'm sorry. Onto Ocean Best Avenue. Best place to hit me. <laughs> Let's petition to bring them back. We, oh, could you imagine? It'd be fun. It would be a lot of fun. It'd be fun. We are standing in the Rumney Marsh burial ground. In 1693, a woman by the name of Mary Smith passed away. Unfortunately, she could not be buried in Boston because there was a smallpox epidemic and they wanted people buried on this side of the river. Where was she buried? Not here. She was buried at the old church on Beach Street, which was there since God knows how long, in tombs. Now, in 1748, this land was bought for a cemetery from, from a fellow by the name of Joshua Cheever. Again, Cheever was the son of Thomas Cheever, a minister and also our first school teacher. Now, here in the Rumney Marsh burial ground, on this stone right here, are the names of many veterans who fought since the colonial wars right up until the Civil War. You will notice on there any of the names that I mentioned already that fought at the Battle of Chelsea Creek. Also on that plaque, unfortunately, is a man of color. His name was Job Warrow. Job Warrow is buried here in an unmarked grave. And to show you how times have changed, if you see Warrow's name on the plaque, you'll see next to his name the word colored. Also buried here are 16 slaves. Please come here. In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was proclaimed by President Lincoln. In 2013, I approached my fellow committee members and I said, wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow recognize slaves who once lived and were once owned by our citizens? And they said, if you do the research, you know, we'll do the groundwork and maybe we'll construct something. Well, sure enough, I did the research and I found the names of the slaves, who owned them, and when they died. And I decided, uh, they, the committee decided, to put two plaques here. I found out that they were buried near the northern wall, obviously in unmarked graves. Well, this is the northern wall. So I figured this would be a wonderful place to put the two plaques. 
We, we, uh, my students think that slavery only existed in the South. No, until 1804, it existed in every single state, even in Vermont. So unfortunately, Revere was not exempt from involuntary servitude. We too had our slaves. Please walk with me, and we'll go down and see where the Civil War veterans are buried. As you walk down, take a look at the stones and read some of the inscriptions and look at the artwork on the stones from the 17th and 18th century. In this section are the men who fought for the Union between 1861 and 1865 and paid the supreme sacrifice. Every year we put flags on their graves. The last person buried here was a Civil War veteran by the name of Louis Ballard, who was buried in 1929. No other burials have gone on since then. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the stone of Dean Winthrop, one of the sons of our first governor, John Winthrop, who, they say, had a magnificent funeral, being the son of a governor, why not? Horse-drawn carriages and cortages would, be, would come here, speeches were made, and again, this is his stone. There's a Dean Winthrop House in Winthrop and a Dean Winthrop Society, and every year members of that society come here and put flowers on Dean Winthrop's grave. One of the oldest stones here, Dean Winthrop. If you, if you ask me where Mary Smith and her husband John Smith, the first people that died, were buried, someplace over there, I don't know where. I just never really found out, but they're, they're there in that part of the cemetery. Okay? It's, it's a historic place. I call it America's, uh, uh, Revere's best kept secret. I am glad that it's off the main drag. Always worried about vandalism and especially my slave, the slave uh, plaques there. Some jerk could come in and do a number on that. But uh, so far, thank goodness, we haven't had any problems at all. And hopefully we'll keep it that way. I want to tell you before we board the bus about one of my colonial heroes. A minister in Revere. And when I tell you his story, I think you'll agree with me that he was an independent thinker and scholar. His name was Reverend Phillips Payson, P-A-Y-S-O-N. On January 15, 1736, Phillips Payson was born to Reverend Phillips Payson of Walpole and his wife Anne. At Harvard, he studied theology and graduated when he was 18 years old. After Thomas Cheever retired, from the church, young Phillips was asked and accepted the position of minister. Just days afterwards, 90 new members joined our church. He was a scholar who trained young men going into the ministry. One was the son of Dr. Joseph Warren, a surgeon who was killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Another one, student of his, was the son of John Rowe the uh, tradesman and shipper who Rose Wharf in Boston is named after. He's called sometimes the fighting parson. Why? Because on April 19, 1775, he announced his patriotism, stepped down from the pulpit, and joined a group of militia on their way to Arlington, known in those days as monotony. Why? He was to cut off the redcoats from reaching Lexington. Lord Percy, was in charge of reinforcements. They never got to Lexington thanks to the fighting parson and the militia that stopped them in Arlington. Who knows if the battle would have gone differently because after Lexington, the colonists were successful in defeating the British and the shot heard around the world at Concord. Payson wrote books also, one about the life of George Washington and one about the Battle of Lexington. In 1787, he represented our town of Chelsea as a representative to the convention to ratify the United States Constitution. As you may or may not know, once the Constitution was finished in September of 1787, nine out of the 13 uh, states had to ratify it. So they had conventions in every state. We had ours in Boston. Our representative was Reverend Payson. Despite being a minister, he stood up and advocated that there should never be a religious qualification to run for any public office. Until his death in January 1801, he was quite active in civil and religious affairs, 
And at his funeral, which was quite lavish, a Dr. Thomas Barnard of Salem said the following, and I quote, in all our revolutionary war, was he not the wise and vigorous friend of his country? And since has not uniformly labored to establish good order and to promote her prosperity? He early became an instructor of youth to prepare them by classical knowledge for admission to higher grades. He was always respectful to his superiors and esteemed and loved by his pupils. Those were the words of Dr. Bernard at Reverend Payson's funeral. Quite a man, and I think you'll agree with me, one who should be remembered as a proud citizen of Revere and our second minister. Let's go to our last stop. <clears throat> Is the Revere Public Library, which has a fascinating history that I'd like to tell you a little bit about. As well as historical landmarks that we have seen in Revere, Revere also was rich in culture as well. Our first library, first library we ever had, was called the Chelsea Social Library in 1825, and it was started by Reverend Joseph Tuckerman, who was the third minister at the old church. In 1897, however, as Revere began to grow, our old town hall, before it was destroyed by a horrible fire, also was our library, and when that fire took place, 2,000 out of 5,700 books were destroyed. In the late 19th century, however, a woman came to our help. Her name was Samantha Sparhawk. She was the head of the Revere Women's League. Well, she went and talked to Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was the steel magnate in the 19th century who made a fortune. In his later years, maybe because he had a guilty conscience, he gave much of his fortune to the building of libraries and concert halls all over the world. Well, when she was in Europe, she convinced Carnegie, or Carnegie, to donate $20,000. Exorbitant price in those days. Henry Pierce, who was then the owner of the Revere Journal, promised an annual appropriation of $2,000. This library right here was dedicated in 1902. And if you look at the top of the front door, you will see a gift Andrew Carnegie and in Roman numerals the year 1902. Along with many other cities, I am proud to tell you that our library was part of the benefactor Andrew Carnegie. I don't know how many of you have studied in there. I know I did when I was in high school. The old high school, by the way, was right next door where I went to school and many of you went to school. So it was really perfect to go right to the library. Um, I'll tell you an interesting story. In 1963, we were about to leave the high school and I heard people whispering about the death of President Kennedy, that he was assassinated. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And I really had no idea what was going on. But then I went into the library and the librarian was crying, crying. And then I realized what had happened. I ran home. Of course, my parents had the TV on. But that's how I first learned of the Kennedy assassination. I was in the 10th, 10th grade at that time. OK, thank you. Let's go. Yep. Back home. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. You're That's welcome. Amazing. Thank you. By the way, uh, our driver, Bill, please give him a round of applause, if you could. He's done a great job. I feel like I've known him all my life. I'm a teacher, but don't worry. There's not going to be any tests at the end of this, so don't worry about that. Uh, no one's going to fail.